As a reminder of where we left off in the last video, we have an idea of what we want. We want to figure out whether our drug is effective or this, this company wants to figure out whether their drug is effective. And it's for all people with hypertension, right? But they can't get everybody. So they draw a sample from that group of 5,000 people with hypertension. Then they're going to give those 5,000 people the drug, or honestly, they'll probably give half of them the drug and half of them a different drug just to compare, things like that. And they'll find out what percentage of them are able to control their hypertension. That's a statistic, right? So you're saying, hey, this was my sample. This is the number I measure about that sample. And then we infer from there about the whole population. So if I think 60% you know, want to do more with gun control, then I think 60% of the whole population want to do more with gun control, et cetera, et cetera. So let me just summarize that. A statistic is a number, numerical measure of a sample. So when you have a small group and you measure something about them, let's say I want to know their average age, um, the average age of a sample of statistics students, or the proportion of a sample of statistics students that prefer early morning classes, um, the average body temperature of a group of people, or um, what percentage of the people are opposed to abortion rights, things like that then I infer from there about the larger population. There is some measure in the population. What's the average age for all statistics students? What proportion of all statistics students prefer early morning classes? What's the average body temperature for all people? Or what percentage of all Americans are opposed to abortion rights? Things like that. Okay. So those would be parameters. Now keep in mind that they're never going to be equal to each other or very unlikely to be equal to each other. This is about a small group, the statistic here, and the parameter is about everybody. Okay. Now how off the two of them are from each other is called sampling error. It's the distance between the two. So, you know, if 75% if up here prefer early morning classes, I guess it's going to be about 75% down here. Maybe it's actually really 78 or 72 or something like that. But how distant those two numbers are is called sampling error. It's because no statistic can ever fully represent the whole population. Okay? But in general, you can imagine the bigger your sample, the smaller your error is going to be. It's much better if you pull 300 people than if you only pull 30 people, for example. I mean, when they want to, you know, find out the president's approval rating, they don't pull 20 people. They pull 1,000 people. There's a reason for that. It's because they don't want a ton of error. All right, now I've given you a little reference here to kind of refer to, and we're going to refer to this several times in the course pack. So let's keep in mind. Now, population is everybody. That is all the people. And there is some number, some measure that you want to know about them. So that would be the parameter. You usually don't know it. Right? because it's such a large group. Let me go back to the body temperature example. This would be the average body temperature for all people on the planet. Well, you don't know what that is. You're not going to go put a thermometer in every single person on the planet. It's not going to happen. Mm -mm. But it's some constant number. You just don't know what it is. Or let me give you another example. What if I want to know the average height of all NBA players? Okay. Right? The average height of all NBA players. Well, I don't feel like going out and measuring every single one of them. Ugh. Right? Well, actually, it'd be kind of cool, but, but I'm not going to get to do it. They won't let me. Right? I don't know what it is, but it's some number. So what I could do instead is I could get a sample. I live in Michigan, so maybe I could get um, all the Detroit Pistons to come to me, and I could measure them. That would be my sample. I'll measure their heights. The average height for that group of my group, the Detroit Pistons, is what I guess it would be for all of the NBA. I can figure out what it is for the Pistons. I just can't figure out what it is for everybody. And of course, it's actually going to depend on what sample. What if I went to the Miami Heat? What if they were different than the Pistons, right? Then that it would vary from sample to sample. The average height for the Pistons isn't different than the average height for the Miami Heat, which is different than the average height for, you know, I don't know, the New York Knicks or whatever. Right? So it varies from group to group to group. The statistic does. The parameter doesn't vary. It's just some number that I can't figure out. Right? I'm just trying to gauge what it would be. All right, so let's look back here at the drug manufacturer. I'm sorry, I made a video already and it got eaten. So this is all typed up. But we have a drug manufacturer interested in the proportion of persons who have hypertension whose condition can be controlled by a new drug the company has developed. A study involving 5,000 people with hypertension is conducted and has found that 80% of the individuals are able to control their hypertension with the drug. 
So the statistic is the 80%. 80% of the sample are able to control their hypertension with that new drug. The parameter is the percent of all people with hypertension who would be able to control their hypertension with the new drug. Okay, that's huge. Like everybody with hypertension, like on the planet, you can't figure that out, right? We don't know what that parameter value is. But we can't give, because we can't give the new drug to everybody. That would be impossible. So we can only give the drug to a random unbiased sample and then infer from there that the whole population will work like that sample did. They do this all the time. Every drug that's basically ever been put on the market, what they do is they give it to a sample of people, see if it works well. And if it does, then they infer from there that the whole population is going to work well. Um, another way to put it is that we don't know the parameter but it should be close to that statistic of 80% as long as our sample was biased or un, excuse me, unbiased and random. That whole idea of should be close, like what do I mean by should and what's close exactly? That is gonna become very important to you from chapter nine onward. Um, if you've ever heard the words margin of error, that's what the closeness is. So we're gonna talk about that a lot in the last chapters of the course. All right, let's move from there to some other definitions. Let's start off with qualitative and quantitative. And again, I'm sorry, you can see all the answers here. So qualitative variables are categorical variables. These are variables that um, define um, all the individuals by some attribute or characteristic. The important part here is that meaningful calculations cannot be done with these variables, even if they're numeric. Now catch that, some of them can be numbers but you, they're not mathematically useful. That is a big deal, okay? So a classic example of this would be like zip code. The zip code is a number, but it's not mathematically useful. I can't add zip codes together and divide by how many there were and get an average. Not an average, it's meaningful. So that, that's actually one of the big clues to you. Always try to think about trying to find the average, i.e. the mean is what we will call it. So if you can't find the mean, then it's no good to you, right? Well, I mean, it's okay, but it's just, it's a qualitative variable. A quantitative variable is meaningful calculations can be done, right? That's a big deal, right? So there are numbers, but there are numbers where you can do meaningful calculations. All right, so let's identify each of these. So you're a nurse and you wanna gather the following information from a patient. So determine whether the following variables are qualitative or quantitative. All right, so let's see here. The name, your name, that's definitely qualitative. That's a word, right? Words are always qualitative. Now, pain level is a rough one. We in our course are going to consider this quantitative. And now, a lot of statisticians would disagree with that. And quite frankly, I agree with them. Um, however, there's established norms um, for pain scales that are numeric and I'm just gonna go with it. So I know that it's horrible statistically speaking because quite frankly, how meaningful is the difference between a four and a three? Eh. But for our purposes, we're gonna treat it like it's quantitative because it's treated like quantitative a lot of the time in the world. Now, whether that's correct or not, no, it's not correct, but we're going to, we're going to treat it like that anyway. All right, what about body temperature? Body temperature is definitely quantitative. Anything you measure about a person, height, weight, body temperature, um, blood pressure, all that stuff, that's quantitative. Now, what about service rating of care? Did you have poor care, fair care, good care, et cetera? That is qualitative. All right, then what about the year born? The year you were born is quantitative. The age um, that you were born in in years, that's quantitative. Like, you know, if I'm 21 years old, that's quantitative. Um, your weight, definitely quantitative. Your social security number, however, is qualitative, right? That is a quality you have. It is not mathematically useful for a number. So we do not treat it like a number. Of course, many would argue that letter B is not mathematically useful. I don't disagree with you, but nevertheless, that's the way we are going to treat it for our purposes. All right, now what about discrete and continuous variables? So quantitative, you can imagine, let me go back, of these two, qualitative and quantitative, which is going to be more mathematically interesting to us in a math course? I mean, statistics is built about numbers. Which one's gonna be more interesting? 
well, quantitative. Quantitative is going to be more interesting. Yeah, exactly. So we're going to subset or subdivide quantitative variables into two types, discrete and continuous. We're doing this for a very good reason. It's because we can do different things with discrete numbers versus continuous numbers, right? We can treat them differently. So a discrete variable is a quantitative variable that has either a finite or limited number of possibilities or a countable number of possible values. Keep in mind, it could be infinite as long as it's countable. So the number of stars in the sky, that's countable. You'd be counting them, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, right? So if you do that, even though you go on forever, it doesn't matter, right? You're still going to be counting, therefore it's discrete. Anything that you count is discrete. It cannot take on every possible value. It's either 1 or it's 2 or it's 3. That is discrete, right? In general, if you're counting and have no decimal places, that's discrete. If you're answering the questions, how many of this, what number are, are people are this way, what number of people are that way, that's discrete. A continuous variable has infinite possible values so that are not countable. Right? You can't count them. They're just everything. Um, so the classic example of this, if you think of it, is a temperature gauge. This is why all the old cartoons make the jokes about the temperature being so high it goes up and breaks the thermometer, right? Because the old time mercury thermometer could go anywhere from, you know, whatever, 90 to 106, right? So it could be any number in that scale in between. That's a continuous variable. That's something you measure. In general, if it's something you measure, that is continuous. If it's something you count, that is discrete. And I have to fix my numbers and my letters here. Hold on one second. There we go. I fixed the letters. Sorry about that. Okay, so pain level, if we're going to go with the fact that pain level on a scale of 1 to 10 is quantitative, then we're going to treat that as discrete, right? Now, my husband always makes the joke when he goes into the doctor's office that his pain level is at pi, you know, 3.1415, blah, blah, blah. So he's very funny. I agree. But, um, He's making a joke. He's making a joke about the continuity of that scale because people say it's one or it's two or it's three or it's four and so on. Um, let me go across here to the year that you were born. The year you were born is discrete. You were born in 1992 or 1994 or whatever. That's discrete. Now your body temperature, that is very much continuous, right? That hence the jokes um, on the old timey cartoons about the mercury thermometers, right? So it could be any number in between. Right. Even digital, even digital thermometers, you can have digital thermometers that have more and more and more decimal places. Right. So in a doctor's office, you probably get to the tenths place. But in a science lab, you might get to the hundredths place or the thousandths place or even more. Right. It all depends on how good a tool you have to measure the, the temperature with. Now your age. Age usually throws students, but your age is actually continuous. Now we tend to round it. Now when you round it, you're rounding to a discrete value, right? But in real life, it's continuous. You're not 21 years old. What you are is 21 years old, 10 months, 3 days, 2 hours, 5 seconds, oops, nope, 6 seconds, oops, 7 seconds, oops, 8 seconds, right? It's continuously changing. It's there's an old song that says time keeps on ticking, ticking, ticking into the future, right? Your age keeps on going and going and going. You are not 20 and then you hop to 21 magically. You're 20 and 0 0.01, 20.02, 20.03, 20.04, all the way up to 20.999999. And then at the second um, of that you were born, it flips over and switches you to 21 and so on. Okay. All right. So age is actually continuous, but... To be fair, a lot of the time we round it and treat it like it's discrete. Okay. Now your blood pressure. Blood pressure is, again, something you measure. Anything you measure, that's continuous. Blood pressure, weight, that's continuous. Body temperature, that's continuous. Now what about your shoe size? Now in the U.S., we have weird. We have decimal shoe sizes. We have 5, 5.5, 6, 6.5, 7, and so on. But if you ever look at the bottom of your shoe and they have European sizing in there, European sizing doesn't bother with that. They just say, you know, 40, 41, 42, and so on. That's because, um, honestly, the five and a half is meaningless, right? So it, it doesn't really matter whether you're five or five and a half. They could have just called it five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. They just didn't want to make people feel like their feet were so big. So they, they went with half sizes, right? So that's discrete. You're either five or you're five and a half or you're six. If you measure the length of your foot, that's continuous. And weight loss or gain is continuous, 